All right. Well, we just finished up with the last set of sessions. I'm here with Peter DiPaolo. He's going to be walking you through um, what you can build in the near hackathon at the conclusion of this event. And he will be joined later by Chad. Um, yeah. So, Peter, go ahead and take it away. Cool. Um, so, yeah, we're going to do a little diversion from the schedule. Um, so I'm not just talking about what you can build at the hackathon. That will be at the end. What I'm actually going to start with is... 100 years in the future, uh, let me share my screen. Here we go. Uh, what, you know, what is, here we go, turn the video back on. Uh, what is blockchain going to be looking like uh, 100 years from now? So there's, uh, oh, yeah, a little bit about me. So I'm Peter. I'm, I'm working on developer experience. So if you guys have used our tools, um, that's uh, the team I'm on. We care a lot about that. Previously, mostly in startups. I uh, worked in health tech, so uh, we took a bunch of data uh, from people who were diagnosed with cancers and then tried to figure out like what other factors aside from the cancer would cause them to die, pretty much. Um, so I've worked in biochemistry, I've worked in software engineering. Um, and then uh, just sort of off the record stuff, I'm also the head of shenanigans. Um, and yeah, so you guys can just go ahead and read that later. So let me jump right in, which is the problem with prediction. Um, so you know, of course, and some shenanigans, um, which is that people looking into the future will make really strong claims. I mean, the situation we're in right now is a really good example, right? No one could have predicted the specific uh, events of COVID-19, but people can predict the generalities that like eventually a plague is going to hit the earth. And so I call these two different directions about prediction divergence. If you make a prediction and then the future diverges from the details of your prediction and convergence, which is you're basically came up with something that was spot on, right? So let's look at some things that were invented a hundred years ago in the 1920s, right? So here's just a few. Um, you have the instant camera was definitely not instant, by the way, that's why I put it in quotes. Traffic lights were invented in the 1920s, movies with sound, the toaster, this is the one thing on this list that's convergent, that actually is pretty much the same uh, as it was when it was in, invented. Um, here, let me actually switch my chat really quick. I realize I'm on the wrong one. Hold on. Um, there we go. Um, OK, and then uh, penicillin. All right, uh, so an, an invention like that would be pretty useful uh, today, right? Um, and so. If you look at this list of inventions from the 20s, most of them were actually replaced by computers. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention, right, mass-produced cars. Maybe Tesla's going to replace these with computers, autopilot, stuff like that. Um, but the toaster is still going strong, and that's the take-home, isn't it? Um, and so if we look not just at what was invented and what got replaced by computers, but what people thought the future was going to look like, what was it going to look like uh, this year, 2020, um, people thought that cities were going to be this beautiful, master planned, um, you know, perfectly cohesive thing, super tall buildings, everything's organized, civilization is organized, maybe we're going to have flying cars. Um, one prediction that came to fruition pretty accurately is this idea of a 600 passenger plane that would fly from New York to London in a day. Well, guess what? Airbus A380 can hold about 525 people. So you guys nailed it on that one. There's these weird predictions about robots who can talk to people. There's this really funny video from the 1920s of a robot firing a pistol. I don't know why they thought that was important to put in the demo. Strange stuff. Um, you, you know, I won't read everything on this list. One funny thing also from that same video is this prediction about a dress that can be adapted for morning, afternoon, or evening. And this is a literal quote from that, from that commercial was, it's the sleeves what does it. Um, the reason I kept that in there is sort of demonstrate like, how far values can diverge in a hundred years, right? How far off predictions are like, we don't really care about that kind of stuff um, as much. I mean, in, in the same way, people still care about fashion, of course. So here's some examples, right? Like, oh, sorry, uh, this is a ship. Uh, this was supposed to be in the year 2000. This is a, a German artist came up with this rendering of ships that were on rails across the Atlantic. Um, this is a vision from Russia, um, also in the, roughly the 1920s. Uh, guess what year this is supposed to be? 1970, which is, of course, we remember the 70s, characterized by geodesic domes. Um, <laughs> Douglas Rourke, yes, we do have weaponized 
drones, which is kind of like robots firing a gun. That's dark and true. Um, here's some other stuff, right? So uh, islands in the air, this idea of airports that were also flying. Maybe we could invent this now, but why would we, right? Um, things people were thinking of for some reason. Then, of course, robots, killer robots. You know, we do have killer robots. Not exactly in the way that we thought, right? These things that are revolting against us when strong AI takes hold in 2020. Um, so a few people just to highlight, right? H.G. Wells, the author of uh, Time Machine, War of the Worlds, he wrote a story called Men Like Gods in 1923 about a theoretical utopia or in our current era, right? 100 years in projection. And he, he actually nailed this one, right? For a utopia, except by previous arrangement, people do not talk together on the telephone. It's kind of accurate but for the wrong reasons, right? A message waits until he chooses to tap his accumulated messages. The transmission is wireless. Um, and remember, this is before the internet. This is like before actually like in the 1920s, broadcasting was invented. So this was pretty prescient. Um, way to go, H.G. Wells. Another shout out is Frank R. Paul. So he drew that picture of robots falling on cars. He drew all of these crazy hallucinations of the future. I highly recommend his art. I'm obsessed with him. He's really cool. And then of course, our favorite guy, Charles P. Strike, the inventor of the pop-up bread toaster, which he patented October of 1923, I think. Um, the, his patent, the functional uh, pieces of the toaster are basically how pop-up toasters work today. So he was of this list, maybe the most accurate um, in his prediction and in his in invention. He really invented something with staying power. So where are we now though, right? Looking back in the 1920s, why, why are these misses so hard? Um, Right. Um, yeah. Thanks, Chad. It was easy to predict mass car ownership. It was hard to predict Walmart. Right. It's these things, uh, what you can predict versus what you can't predict. If you look at this picture of Times Square in the before times, you have these LCD monitors, blasting images, advertisements for different products that no one even had thought to think of in the 20s. And of course, the centerpiece of this picture is the smartphone that's taking a picture of this scene. Um, right. And so the thought of computers becoming so small that you can fit them in the pocket and that these telephone radio devices would be things that everybody in the world has and uses just, you know, stares at them six inches from their face. It's very hard to predict. Right. So why am I talking about all of this stuff? Oh, and a quick note. Thank you, Charles P. Strike. Yeah. October 18th, 1921. This is the pop up toaster. All right. You'll never forget now. Pop up toaster. Charles P. Strike. Anytime you have bread with toast on it. Yeah, all right. So yeah, why am I talking about this? Well, let's think about 2120. Let's try to do what the people in the 1920s did. Um, rather than me making predictions, I'm just going to take some media from our current era, you know, the 21st century and, and, and take a peek at it, right? So Ready Player One, uh, the namesake of this convention is a story, of course, about this infinite virtual world. Everyone has their own avatars and they can own property inside of this. They buy and sell stuff. There's a market. Um, and this is supposed to be 2045 in the fiction, right? So uh, according to the author, the creator of the story, Ready Player One, this is only like 20 years off in the future, right? And so if we're looking from the 2020s, into 2120 um, at recent media, right? We have like CRISPR, gene editing saves us all. We can create designer babies. We can prevent the next coronavirus from happening. Here's two companies working on it, Horizon and CRISPR Therapeutics. Um, we're living in space maybe, right? We still want to colonize other planets thanks to SpaceX and NASA. They're working on these things. Parallel simulated virtual universe, right? Facebook is working on VR, Apple. I'll blow through these other ones. Algorithmically generated content everywhere, right? That's probably likely 100 years from now, all content is algorithmically generated. Maybe strong AI will win. Maybe we'll finally achieve that war on robots that people have been thinking about for 100 years. Quantum computers will probably be a thing. And then maybe we'll be able to upload our consciousness, right? This is the singularity. We've been talking about this for several years. If you've read Ray Kurzweil, he talks a lot about this. So here's this list, right? And next to these ideas, in parentheses are companies actually currently working on the technology that could make these a reality in 100 years. And uh, I want to I dig into one of them, which is this idea of uploading consciousness. So this is a show that just came out, I think, like a week or two ago called Upload about a guy who died. This is not a spoiler. It happens really early in that episode. Um, a guy dies and his consciousness is uploaded into this heaven like place. And there's these various heavens that you can choose. And, you know, the story is about uh, uh, the interaction between uh, 
you know, this this dead guy whose consciousness survives in a real living person. And, uh, you know, it, it raises a lot of interesting questions. One question it kind of hints at, but doesn't ask uh, directly, which is like, in this scenario, who owns your consciousness, right? Um, if you imagine digitizing yourself and, um, yeah, some super intelligence, maybe there's a super strong AI and like in order to keep up for it, with it, we need it to achieve the singularity, right? But it's going to live somewhere, right? Who owns the computer that the AI is operating on? Who owns the consciousness with these humans on it? Um, and so uh, that leads me to, you know, ask you uh, or actually make you uh, ask you to ask yourself, what is blockchain going to do for you, right, in the future? Um, a lot of the narrative of blockchain has kind of fallen away. There's less discussions about, like, this far-flung future of, of the direction of blockchain, right? So if we do have consciousness uploaded, do you really want to trust a single company with your consciousness? Um, you know, here's another one is, do geographically bound states even make sense in an infinite virtual world? Um, should small groups of individuals control the global economy? Um, what constrains the strong AI? How do you run computation across the stars? Um, all of this is very speculative, and I'm I, I'm I'm doing that on purpose, right? I'm I'm considering what what direction now uh, can we choose with blockchain? What s small things can we start building now that will point us in the direction of you know uh, a, a perfect utopia, uh, decentralized consciousness? I mean, this kind of stuff. If we're to pick our current universe as the seed for it, looks like Apple, you know, is going to own some subset of uh, heaven where you upload your consciousness when you die, right? I mean, that's kind of rough uh, to think that like you have to trust a company, a, a single entity, with you, with every your entire livelihood, your, your everything that is you. Um, and you know, similarly, if you just imagine the future of blockchain, if you're creating a strong artificial intelligence, it does need some form of constraint. A blockchain is actually not a crazy solution to that. So, all right, we're getting super far ahead of ourselves because all of this stuff sounds great, but it's 100 years in the future. And as I discussed about convergence and divergence, I'm probably mostly wrong. And we, as a a human civilization are probably wrong about uh, what we think is going to happen. Our predictions are probably mostly divergent. They'll be replaced by something we haven't thought of yet. But um, there is a lot of stuff in development now, right? Like, so virtual estate uh, needs to exist. Uh, Decentraland was working on this. I don't know the status of the product or the project, but it's a really exciting idea of creating the base layer of property in a virtual setting. If you imagine this infinite virtual world, well, there's actually a lot of technical limitations. Um, you know, where does, where does the computation come from? Uh, sorry about that notification. Uh, where does the, um, you know, how, how do you buy and uh, sell things? How do you develop ownership? Um, and again, right, digital ownable property, OpenSea's working on a marketplace for this. There are plenty of NFT is a laundry list I'm not gonna name. Um, distributed storage, right? Um, so I think we may have spoken recently. And then of course there's IPFS if you're familiar. Um, <laughs> yeah, Damon mentions that there's a startup somewhere work, working on consciousness cold storage. Uh, transaction fees were horribly high. So, you know, potentially a public good could replace that. Um, better currency, everyone knows that we need this right now. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, when the economy is uh, struggling, it's really clear that uh, we need something that's not bound to nation states to be able to transact. Um, is it gonna be Libra? Is it gonna be MakerDAO that develops? Is it Bitcoin, you know? Um, and then we get into these more philosophical things that we can actually start developing today, like a new system of government, right? Maybe a non-centralized, maybe uh, if you don't care about decentralization, uh, you know, you must care about something political. And I would beg, or beg the question, that's not the right use of that phrase. I would beg you to question uh, your own uh, political beliefs. Well, does it make sense to prescribe to a government just because you happen to live in a physical location anymore? Um, I don't think so, right? Identity tied to your virtual avatar. Some people are working on identity. Do you want to work on this? And then, you know, this long list of things that are just like, um, completely theoretical, right? The idea of custody, co-ops, um, infinite internationalization, we'll get into that, escrow, right? Instead of trusted parties. Um, 
And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is like the thing, right? Like crypto corgis was this fun example we made of NFTs of transferable goods. Um, you know, maybe this is the toaster of blockchain, right? Like in a hundred years, maybe the basic NFTs we've come up with will still be usable. Um, because remember, when you're considering the divergence and convergence of these big ideas, um, it's it's super hard, as I've said you know, a couple of times, it's super hard to predict what's got staying power and who would have thought that the toaster would have been the one thing on that list that's basically the same design. Um, you know, we actually don't know. It's, in, it's impossible to say which is gonna converge and which is gonna diverge. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's it's worth uh, it's worth considering at least what are the seeds you want to plant now that will inspire the next generation to invent the next computer. And it's worth considering the base layer of these future technologies we think are going to happen. Uh, what are the limitations? What are the boundaries? What, what what is the actual foundational unit to start working on today? Um, that's all I've got for presentation. Uh, now I'm going to invite uh, my colleague, Chad, to come on. We're going to talk about some of these ideas you can build today if you do want to participate in the hackathon. And Shane, uh, Sovereign Individual, I actually haven't read that, so I'll check it out if it's related to uh, this stuff. Um, humans are like the bootloader for strong AI. That was Gauchi. Uh, yeah, probably if, if it, if it uh, comes to fruition. So here's a few ideas we're gonna we're gonna talk about. Chat if you want, you can take over. I'll stop sharing. Cool. All right. Oh, uh, sorry. This is Chad Ostrowski, uh, awesome engineer, hey, working also on developer experience. Yeah, take it yes. away. Chad. All right. Uh, I've got a presentation here. Let me put the link to the slides in the chat before I start, since that's something people usually ask for. And then I will share my screen and. Oh, we'll just go with one Chrome tab. We'll see how it works. And we will return on my camera. All right. And if I share my, if I present, can you see it? Looking good? I can't hear anyone. You're looking good. All right. <laughs> Excellent. OK, uh, so I have an Apple Watch. and. Um, Oh, it's going to show this presenter mode the whole time, huh? That's a weird thing. All right, you're probably all used up, I know. Uh, this is the unlock screen. Well, this is the unlock screen in English, but I recently started learning Chinese, and I put my watch in Chinese, um, even though I barely speak any yet, because the watch interface mostly doesn't have a lot of text, actually. It's mostly symbolic stuff, like that backspace icon. Um, but I do already know the one piece of translated text on this screen, OK, gets translated as how, um, which means good, but obviously means few other things also. Both of these are used as confirmation here. Apple maintains a giant database of all of these translation strings. I don't know if it changes per app uh, or, or like per platform, maybe. Um, but yeah, Apple has, has their own huge database of all these kinds of translation strings. They're super great at it. Google is super great at it, right? They can both afford to be. Um, and lots of other companies have these same kind of translation strings. And something that I think seems possible, for simple words at least, and I'll talk a little bit more about that soon, is um, this, could be, this could be a commons, this could be a public good, that if this translation for OK to how used for confirmation is already in the system, it can be used for free. And then blockchains give us the tools to, uh, if I, as an app developer, say that I want to translate OK into Arabic, and that translation isn't in the system yet, I can put up a little bit of money and when someone translates it and it gets verified, once it's like added to this system, my money gets dispersed to the people who actually did that translation work. And now this new tra translation of OK into Arabic can be used by anyone for free in their own apps, um, which would be a huge benefit, right? Like even if this doesn't work for uh, every organization and they want to maintain their own brand voice for some words or, or some phrases, or entire organizations, like I said, it could be a great way to um, 
allow a lot of apps that currently can't afford to hire translators and maintain these databases to get their apps into the hands of a lot, uh, a lot of new people and make their customers more, more comfortable. So the kinds of phrases that probably don't work so well, anything that's long, um, this is the first sentence of Homer's Odyssey, um, translated by Robert Fitzgerald as, sing in me muse and through me tell the story of that man skilled in all ways of contending, and translated more recently by Emily Wilson as, tell me about a complicated man. Translation is obviously uh, an incredibly, um, it's an art form, right? And single words like this, polytropos, if I understand, if I remember correctly how to say this, I, I do not speak Greek. Um, this one word is what gets translated in by Fitzgerald as skilled in all ways of contending and by Wilson as complicated. So uh, like I said, this, this you know, universal or like, uh, yeah, universal internationalization is not going to work for all phrases, for all words. The shorter the word, the more common, the more precise, the better it's going to work. So let's think about how such an app, such a system could work. Uh, I'm missing a slide. Da, 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 where did my slide go? Oh, bummer. Hang on, y'all. I'm going to undo a couple times because I had a really great slide in there. That's no longer here. OK, well, bummer. Let's just, I'll just show you this. So um, this is what I had up here. And I meant to duplicate my slide. And something got messed up. And, and that slide is gone. And pressing undo is not working right now. I'm not sure why. Um, so. We have this app developer, the turtle, who wants to say OK in Mandarin, Arabic, Italian. Um, the system will spit back in Mandarin. It's how. Um, <clears throat> and then we have a translator, right? This is the second person. Note that these people need not even be using the same application interface, the, the, same, the same app, right? We're used to thinking in apps, but with decentralized systems, uh, this could be this could just be developer tooling here, right? This could be a VS Code plugin uh, for this app developer. And maybe this person is actually using an app. So here, let me duplicate this slide and move it up here because that's where I was. Actually, I was here. So this is a multi-sided market. Look at this. Multi-sided market. And then you... Another another two stakeholders that I can think of right now is someone who's going to verify translations. And you need someone else who's going to, like the end user basically, needs a way to report translations basically or contest them. Let's make the end user a octopus uh, contests translations. Uh, because if spam or smut get into the system, you need a way to get rid of it, right? If the translator and the verifiers collude in some way to, uh, if 4chan piles in here and translates a bunch of things um, in a spammy way uh, and gets those into the system, we need a way to remove them. So that's kind of the full, that feels to me like a full way that could work. I've made the translators and the verifiers the same creature because I think that probably makes sense as the same app. Um, but otherwise, this seems like this is just the, the individual developer's app where this person could potentially have a way to contest translations or report them, um, which would go back to the developer who would probably kick that off. Uh, really quickly, this this to summarize what the service does is you're a developer and you want to build an application that you can then distribute into multiple languages, right? Like these are the buttons, these are the forms that you might want to translate, not necessarily blocks of paragraphs or blocks of content, right? Exactly. It would be like the the word menu, the word OK, the word blockchain. I don't know, right? <laughs> like the word wallet, the word account. Um, so very specific parts of your user interface, not 
entire chunks of text. That That is what I'm saying is like, that is definitely an art form or even longer phrases might be something that doesn't really work in here. Uh, I have a previous coworker who is Polish, lives in Poland and um, a, a famous mistranslation in a video game was supposed to say, socialize with your friends. And in Polish it ended up saying, spread socialism with your friends. Nice. Um, <laughs> so, right. So even phrases like that, I think there's room, like maybe, maybe single words are the best place to start. Maybe this app at the beginning only allows single words in the source language, but even then do all of them get translated into a single word in the final one? I don't know. This is like, we'll get a little bit more into this about like ways I think you might be able to uh, like address that design challenge. But I think that there is a certain uh, like set of where I suspect that there's a certain set of concepts that would be pretty universally translatable. Um, okay, so let's start here. Let's zoom in on this part. I, this app developer wants to say okay in three languages, but what does that really look like? So I want to say, okay, in Mandarin, Arabic, Italian, they say, and the system would have to come back and say like, okay, well, okay means a lot of things. I grabbed the top three definitions from my Apple dictionary here, but um, assent, agreement, acceptance, to introduce an utterance, to invite agreement, approval, or confirmation, right? Like all of these things would have to come back and the app developer would need a way in their VS Code plugin or whatever it is to say like, meaning one, please. And it can say, all right, well, in Mandarin, it's how. And that's it. I don't have any other translations. Um, and then this app developer would need a way to like stake some money or put some money on like, I will pay someone to translate this into Arabic or maybe this dialect of Arabic, right? Arabic is spoken in very different ways in different parts of the world um, and Italian. So one thing that might help here, uh, how are these root phrases stored? How is the, um, that all of that context around these words, how is that represented in the system? Um, one thing that seems like it could be useful here is Lajban, a carefully constructed spoken language. Um, I don't know how good the resources are around Lajban out there right now. So like it might not quite be ready for prime time, but this could be a good collaborative effort. The way it builds itself is a machine parse. It's machine parsable. So the syntactic structure and validity of a sentence is unambiguous and can be analyzed using computer tools. Syntactically ambiguous, right? But no language can be semantically unambiguous. Um, that's the, like, that polytropos word is a concept that does not exist in, in our current languages. Um, and Lajban allows the expression of nuances and emotion using words called attitudinals, which are like spoken emoticons. So this seems like it could be a good way to store root phrases rather than in English with like a little additional context, which could lead to a lot of duplicate entries in this system and make it unusable in the long term. Maybe Lajban helps us deal with that problem. Whether we need this at the initial version or not is uh, an open question. Um, but let's move. Let's let's look at some possible architecture for such oh. an app real quick. Okay. So this Just is bring move on. Uh, let's both kill video because it looks like it'll make the slides bigger, um, and then mm. that way people can see them. Sure. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, in the chat, you guys? You can also double click on this. Well, maybe that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. On work on main page. Page. What, what Why? Was That's so weird. Right. Yeah. yeah let's, let's, let's keep it going. All right, there we go. looks like that worked. Sure. So a possible architecture for this thing. Um, this is like thinking in web three, right? If you're, uh, my background is mostly in web two, but um, here's how I would take a stab at developing this. So if you want to come to the hackathon and you have an idea, we can help you kind of do this architectural stuff. But in the UI, which I would just do in the browser because that's my forte. Uh, so if I were building an initial MVP version of this in a hackathon, um, I would do the whole thing in the browser and it would be one app, right? Like I would sign up and say, I'm a developer. Um, or maybe there's just like 
translate a word, something like that, right? Different tabs for translators and developers. But as the developer, I would need some kind of like dictionary and a Lajbon translation where it's basically like, I want to say, okay, and it can look up possibly locally, maybe, I don't know how big dictionaries are, uh, or maybe you query dictionary.com or something in the background and pull back and say, well, okay, means these different things, which one do you want? You pick the one you want, and then it'll translate that word into Lajbon for you in the background. Again, this is all using APIs like web two existing services. Um, there's no web three stuff here yet. Uh, where Web3 starts is once you have that Lajbon word, you can query a smart contract and say, like, wh what, is the, what is the data associated with this Lajbon word? And it just spits back an IPFS hash. And again, in the browser, uh, you can look up that IPFS hash, and it will return a JSON object. Mandarin, how? Um, and then... When the translator comes in, adds a new translation, right? That's going to change uh, this. I, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Uh, when when the translator comes in and adds Arabic down here, um, then can you see it when I just move it like this? By the way, <clears throat> my cursor, or do I have to click? Yeah, yeah no, it's visible. Cool. All right. So when when the translator adds a new one. That would that would kick off an on chain, right? Like that kicks off a, a transaction on chain to update this IPFS hash. So that's how that whole system could work. Um, but that's the that's the starting point. So if you want to build this, um, I think a good starting point is maybe just this. Um, if you can get to it, then adding in this translator would also be super sweet. And I would just leave out those other parts for now, especially that part that I talked about earlier, the contesting things, right? Like that gets into this very complicated question of um, like a judicial process on chain. There are some interesting projects on Ethereum that are kind of trying to do that, um, but I don't know how well they work right now. And in general, it's like a way bigger topic than what you would want to build at a hackathon. So I would just build this. Um, that is my one idea that I made slides for. So I'm going to stop sharing this tab now and we can turn our, our cameras back on. Um, cool. Oh, I never turned mine off, did I? Yeah, I think you did. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so, so uh, there's two things. So we're gonna start talking about a few other ideas. I think we've got um, about, yeah, like 27 minutes. Um, and uh, if you're in the chat and you have an idea that you want us to sort of pick apart, maybe discuss some of the architecture for. Uh, or if you want to jump in and share your video and chat through it with us, that would be super cool. Uh, yeah, OK. We might not do that one uh, just because of the technical <laughs> challenge of it. Uh, but if you want to throw your ideas out in chat, we'll, we'll talk through them. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so one of the things that I think is really cool is what Decentraland is trying to do. Um, and so here's another hackathon idea I had, which is uh, it's Decentraland, but rather than starting with the entire universe already built and selling plots of it, um, it's generated procedurally as users join, right? So you imagine that you've got like each user has like a 10 by 10 grid that they come with. So if they sign on, they're basically buying into procedurally generate in Minecraft, maybe it's kids, right? Uh, vertical to the top and vertical to the bottom of like the entire height of whatever the size of your your cube is going to be, right? Maybe it's like uh, 29 blocks down, I think is what Minecraft is, and then like 100 blocks high, um, and then it's 10 by 10 uh, square. What would be cool about this is one of the problems Decentraland has right now, I don't know if you guys have checked it out, is like if you go into Decentraland, there's nobody there. There's a lot of these like plots where people have designed some cool stuff, but you have to walk between them um, and there's not a lot to do. So if you come in with your friend, it's kind of, you know, like, what are you, uh, what, yeah, what, what are you going to do? If you have this procedurally generated thing, uh, there's lots of implications that you have when you start, right? So you start and me and Chad start at the same time. We each have like a 10 by 10 plot that is generated right next to each other. That creates the entire universe. Um, it means that the bounds of the universe are always going to be the uh, relative to the number of players as they join, which is kind of fun. Um, 
And you can do stuff like if you have materials. Um, I don't know if you guys have played Settlers of Catan, uh, but this is a game about trading resources. Maybe the hackathon version, the very first one, is four people uh, jumping into this could generate a, a random Settlers of Catan board and then play a game in this space. Um, that one doesn't necessarily benefit specifically from what you can get from a blockchain, uh, but it might be a cool, fun hackathon project. And then later you can have a version of Minecraft, essentially, where as you're jumping in, you have different kinds of materials. Folks who have already mined their blocks, um, maybe like Chad has a lot of like stone and I have a lot of wood um, and we want to trade, uh, then you actually create this like... Boy, mining um, blocks takes on... Oh yeah, I know. It's a whole other thing, right? Um, It'll be called validate craft for our, for our case. Um, but yeah, so so Chad, what would you think is a good first uh, cut? Like, what, what would be the first thing that you'd want to do if you were making that one? If you're going to make uh, the the decentraland but procedurally generated for a hackathon? If we we're going to sit down, where would we start? Uh, I like this idea of of the world being the size of the number of people who have joined it already, and then like giving ownership of the stuff within that plot to that person, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like <clears throat> you you actually own the resources there, and so it's like this you can start developing that economy. So I, I think I don't know if the settlers of the settlers of Catan one sounds fun. I don't know if it's as I would take a swipe at building like the full thing, right? Like even if it's a little rough, I think it's more of a a compelling use of blockchain where like now we have these digital resources that we can start selling to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think I think I would do something like that. Although using hex like spaces oh, within yeah. instead of squares might oh, be uh, hexagons. Yeah, yeah. Make it hexagons, and uh, I think I think you'll see more interest. Um, Chad said the only thing I'd want to build with blockchain right now would be easy crypto payments to small businesses XRP. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of XRP or if or if uh, you're shilling or whatever or if you're serious, but uh, that's actually like a really good um, use case. Uh, oh, that, that totally reminds me is uh, something I didn't write in my slide was this idea I had. It's for free. If anyone's participating in the hackathon, I tell like everyone in every hackathon we've done, like steal this idea just because I want to use it. I think it could turn into a viable business, which is what I call pool party. Um, the basic idea, pretty simple. So say Chad and I want to go do something together, like river rafting or qu quarantine's off. We're going to go river rafting together. Um, <clears throat> and you know, it costs like $200, like pretty expensive for a day long event. And, um, oh yeah. So, so, uh, I'm the one who's got to front the money and I'm like, well, Hey Chad, last time I paid for river after you didn't pay me back. Um, and so instead of just paying up front, I'm going to use this app, right? Which is a threshold group payment. So the final product would look like uh, an account is generated where both of us can pay into it. And I can actually use that account uh, to pay for things like it's got a debit card associated with it um i can go to the river raft store the debit card actually only works if there's enough money for the event that i set up so i put in half the money chad puts in half the money and then the uh the uh card uh works when the threshold is reached sorry it looks like i might have accidentally started an xrp uh flame war <laughs> for talking about that um so uh yeah oh also the speaker is chad not just chad gainer in the chat so there's a double chad going on um but uh yeah so so if you want to uh attend the hackathon and you want to build this build it for me which is pull party thresholded payments um so chad yeah what are your thoughts on that one <clears throat> yeah i i think that makes a ton of sense i think for um the like pool party or going river rafting is definitely an example of when something like that could make sense. Um, I think, I think there are a lot of like a family reunion or something like that where like, you know, you're looking for a lot of small contributions from like a bunch of people in your extended family um, and having like, Hey, we like need to hit this number or it's not happening. So please mm -hmm. contribute. It, it's a, uh, it, it seems like it would definitely prevent the financial burden from falling more on one person, which is my guess at what happens with a lot of like large, like volunteer organized events right now, which is essentially what like families and friends are doing. 
Right. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of those, like in the late summer slash fall. Uh, you know, I I think people. Yeah. When we're finally out of lockdown. lockdown. Yeah. Exactly. It's going to be like family reunions and like campouts and stuff like that. Um. All right, chat guys. Let's calm down over XRP and chain link. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so to, to bring it back to you guys, anyone who's, uh, still paying attention and not Googling what the problems are with, with these, uh, these <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> they have a, a hackathon idea they've been considering that they wanted to build and want us to, want us to maybe come up with stuff or, for I know there have been sessions like ad hoc sessions or, or as part of some of the sessions I've been in, people have been kicking around just like dap ideas. Right. Um, yeah. So. Anything like that would be fun to talk about here. Cool, yeah. Um, well, one of them that you mentioned I liked was the guild idea for restaurants, co-ops. Do you want to get dig into that a little sure. bit? Sure, yeah. This this might go to your thought, Chad Gainer, if that's how we say your last name. Um, easy crypto payments to small businesses. I'm not sure if this is where you were going, um, but another idea I had ties into that. Um, so something that i miss uh since i graduated college is meal plans um i don't have to think about right like and when i go on vacation or or uh like a company a company retreat where all the meals are prepared for me it's just like such a mental burden removed where like i don't have to think about what i'm eating next uh it's glorious um and i think it could be a really interesting offering for like I live in a small city of 60,000 people. So here it could potentially be like most restaurants in my entire city could like form a cooperative um, and offer a, a meal plan. And maybe, I don't know what the price point is to make it make sense. Maybe it's, let's just say $300 a month. I don't know if I would spend that, but let's say it's $300 a month as an example. Um, I pay my $300 a month. And now when I go into any of the participating restaurants, I like flash the QR code on my phone and I can like order something and not need to pay for it. This might work better for just breakfast and lunch places, right? There are other ways that you could do this. Maybe it's breakfast and lunch only. The, the, I see this as like mostly an arrangement done by the restaurants, not, um, not a tech problem per se. Um, but if restaurants want to do this, and, and it also right now, what I like about it is that it gives me a way to, if, if this existed already, it would give me a way to help keep the entire restaurant scene in my city afloat while they're having a lot of trouble bringing in their regular income, right? Like I can't go in, um, and, and a lot of restaurants are like selling gift cards and stuff like that, but that gives me... Like that lets me support my, my favorite ones that I'm thinking of, but it's right. not necessarily helping me support like, oh, there's that like, when I walk by it, I remember that I really love the guacamole at this place. And like, I'll go in and buy some with friends because we're just right. out and it's nearby. Um, so, so those are the restaurants that like a bunch of those could end up dead after this. So I like the, I like the kind of uh, positive sum ethos of that where like I'm helping keep the entire scene alive with this with this contribution and it would potentially give you a way to like I'll chip in a little extra toward a meal plan for someone who can't afford it um so lots of lots of cool spins on this what I see the tech being useful for is a single cooperative of restaurants could uh like basically deploy their own smart contract right mm -hmm. and like they are managing and like that's behind the scenes they don't know that exists but it it would give them a really easy way to spin this up where it's totally in their control and they could configure some levers right like they can say um maybe part of my three hundred dollars maybe a hundred dollars of that three hundred gets evenly split between all the participating restaurants maybe that's too much to get evenly split i don't know i'm not on the i'm not a restaurateur um but maybe and then the rest of it like gets uh divvied out to restaurants as i go to them or at the end of the at the end of the month is tough um unless they can count on me being like maybe at the end of the week something like that um but it would let them configure some of those levers. Like how much do we want to be distributed to all the restaurants in this co-op versus based on my actual usage? 
Um, and you could also make it like I, I just realized this as I was thinking about it like earlier today. You could make this a um, token curated registry, which is like a, an idea from Crypto Land for like when new restaurants apply to join this, the exist maybe you you could set it up so that the existing restaurants all get a vote. And maybe their voting power is proportional to how long they've been part of this guild. Right. Something like that. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, on the demand side, too, it's not crazy to think people are going to pay for the convenience of not having to think about this, right? I mean, um, there's tons of these food boxes where you pay a subscription fee. And people will just send you a box of, like, prepared groceries to cook meals. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that, it's, it's basically that for restaurants or even delivery if it were to, like, launch today. Um, and, and then just reading these in reverse order of the chat, restaurants can manage fleet for food delivery in their neighborhood to not over rely on percentage fees that Uber eats in the cart. Right, so, right. Like this, this co-op, if it were really successful, could hire their own delivery people as like employed by the co-op or as members of the co-op instead of, instead of needing to rely on these, uh, like, you know, price gouging uber eats kind of delivery services right um oh i want to address a couple of ideas that were thrown out so like the idea of something like a leveraged uh etf where was that oh yeah uh pricing algorithm uh for pricing digital assets such as leveraged etfs in traditional asset markets um i think that's a great like yeah that's a great idea one of the challenges specifically with leverage ets if you're leveraging pricing digital assets is that you need a lot of debt you know, you, i mean that's the c word which in this case is collateralization uh <laughs> um and so i think it's a really cool idea though um i don't know what primitive i would start with maybe just uh specifically like how can i i think what i would do for a hackathon project for john mclaughlin's idea is basically um taking taking some particular index that I'm interested in and then figuring out if I can find projections and pricing of, of the actual index rather than uh, like getting too hardcore into, um, you know, the idea of leveraging. Uh, if, if I'm understanding the idea, sorry if I'm slaughtering idea, John McLaughlin, that was just from your one little blurb. Um, Alexander Nix said, a decentralized idea factory slash marketplace where people upload ideas along with assets and other data oh, and other data and people can vote, comment, contribute, fund the ideas. I think this is a great idea. Um, and one uh, project that was really similar to this was Hit Record by um, Joseph Gordon Levitt, I think is his name. I always mix his name up, I think I nailed it. Um, and so the idea behind Hit Record was people would upload small snips of like video or audio um, or pictures, and then other people would remix them together to create like whole content. And uh, it's a really cool idea, but it kind of fell apart. I think that this is one of those ideas that can really benefit from decentralization uh, because you can kind of get a little fuzzy around IP law, or if you want to focus on the problem of IP, really drive into, well, how do you actually own a snippet of song, right? I, Audius, shout out to them. They're working on uh, something similar uh, with, with audio. Very cool. Um, and then going yeah, I'm wondering what kind of assets with that. So is this, I, I feel like the idea factory slash marketplace would benefit. It feels like mostly a marketing challenge to me, right? Like it, it feels like it would benefit from being well constrained um, where like these are startup ideas or something like that, right? Um, and potentially again being a it could benefit from being a token curated registry so not everything makes it into the list mm -hmm. um so that the list stays you know useful and, and and so more people want to come scan this list for ideas um yeah it feel it feels like it could be a little bit unwieldy with right. like duplicate ideas and those kinds of things, but, or just a ghost town where like people don't know about it. So I, I think that marketing piece and, and figuring out how to constrain the use of it feels yeah. like the biggest challenge to me. Yeah. I mean, like, I think the more I think about digital assets in general, the deeper I realize that well is as a problem, um, simply because of the nature of <laughs> digital goods, right? Like, like even if you say something is not copyable, maybe the address is singular, but like I could take a screenshot of like some digital art and say like, look, I, you can look at this somewhere else, right? I can send you the screenshot. Um, so I feel like you took that in a different direction than what I was saying, but yes, like I, I, same thing. I, 
yeah, it's a different. It's a, it, it's it's a, like a one up. It's orthogonal to your. Company. Yeah, I guess it's like I could take someone else's idea, change it just a tiny bit, and say that it's my idea. Um, and if it's token curated registry, then there's a human way to say like, no, that idea doesn't make it in here. Well, and, um, and but that could be a like, I don't want to. I've heard that these token curated registries are like one that exists for keeping track of like influential crypto Twitter accounts um, right. is yeah. like, I forget what it's called, but it's like a, a tremendous burden to be part of it where like there are these votes happening all the time and like then no one turns out to vote for the stuff. So so uh, one thing a TCR could be really good for as well, and I'm actually not sure about the moral implications of this because regulators try to shut these down super hardcore, which is off market real estate. I learned recently that like a lot of real estate, particularly, so I live in San Francisco or San Francisco area, right? Um, most of the real, not most, a lot of the real estate, like prime real estate is actually sold off market. And legally you're supposed to list this stuff, but what they do is they basically have these private gray markets where they'll post the listings before it goes onto the market. And then the day before it's sold, they post it on the market, but they've already made all of the deals. So the competitive offer has already been made before you as a consumer could go and buy this house. Well, see, why do that? I mean, I can see doing that if like you want to sell it to your, if you want to sell your house to your child or a friend or something like that. But what's the, what's the bigger, this sounds more like a bigger scene than that. What is the. It's actually not that great for buyers who are in the public. It's really good for investors and then for sellers who want to constrict. So, so there's a couple of problems. Like if you're selling real estate, if you're a listing agent, then uh, your problem is consistency of cash flow. What you want to do is sell as many houses as possible consistently over time. And so if you're able to basically use this as a marketing tool to a set of investors who are going to just basically like get into a line and then buy your next house and then the next person buys the next house and then the next person buys the next house because it's like this off market deal, uh, you have consistent income. You're selling it still though at a market rate because right now, specifically in the insane market of the Bay Area, people are are spending like you know 20 percent more than listing price most of the time so so i don't know if off-market real estate would work in other places and like i said morally gray because it's like this it's morally gray it doesn't feel great to me don't like that one no one yeah, built yeah, that yeah. idea but, <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, but, but there's there's a there's actually a silver lining that's morally positive here which is if you have like a tcr for the public right it's like um you can punish people like you can punish bad selling agents who are sketchy right like um and you can you can like have a something more equitable if you're able if you're able to basically say all right people who are able to list here are good players right so you have like a public closed market it's actually an open mm -hmm. market but it's a tough argument to make but if you're a evil capitalist and you want to make a lot of money that's your idea for you okay, well while we're talking about evil capitalists making a lot of money i've got one okay. um make a physical good like a toaster here's our improvement on the toaster charles p strike yeah yeah, yeah. All right, I want to make toasters that uh, sit beside the other toasters at the department store or the Amazon listing or whatever, and they're free. And then when you buy them, you have to pay per use a small amount of cryptocurrency. Ooh, all right. So it's yeah. a is it a rental? It's not a rental. It's just a pay per use. You can't use it without paying a small fee. How is that not right? You could reduce the fee over time. It has like a built-in crypto wallet that you okay, have to like send money to i mean you basically stumbled upon like what crypto can do for iot right like imagine if every single I mean, uh, one, one crappy thing that if and this is like uh super mind-bending but if you go into a hotel rather than the hotel individual units being owned by one conglomerate each doorknob that has a key basically has its own wallet right like so you can have like hotels where rooms are owned by individuals oh. Scan in. You don't even need a. Um, you don't even need like the check-in. Exactly. You know, right. you just walk yeah. in. You use your your Apple Pay. You scan the door. It's got its own wallet. Like it's it's an IoT device. Um, I do want to uh, address some of the stuff in the chat. Um, so uh, there was unsecured loans. Um, I mean that you you can totally do it technically. It's just then the question of like, do you want to be the lender for unsecured loans? Um, <laughs> I'll come back to that idea of securing loans in a distributed way. Um, 
Then uh, one thing I, I think is really cool for Mohit Pandey, sorry if I said your name wrong, which is smart, a smart contract store. Uh, user just use ready-made smart contracts and plug into their apps. Like I think this is um, the way we describe it at Near a lot of times in the collective is this idea of a composable smart contract market, right? You come in here um, and you want to like pick up a, um, I, I mean, like this toaster app, right? Like uh, it needs a wallet, it needs some way of transferring payments, it needs an account system. And like you put this together, um, rather than writing any backend code, you've just composed these uh, apps. The developers, each time someone uses that toaster and they scan it, get paid um, some small fraction. I think this is maybe one of the most exciting things in like software engineering is the idea of composable applications. I have a lot of questions around like what that will, I'm really curious to see what this will look like. I'm a total believer in composable applications and I think there are a lot of different ways that it could shake out. The, um, there's a dark version of the re of reality too, right? Which is like the gig economy taken to its logical extreme, um, right? Where it's like, um, you, you wake up and you like pay to look at your watch. And like every time you turn the phone- <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Thing. There's actually, there's a short story by Cory Doctorow called uh, Unauthorized Bread, where the <laughs> toaster only toasts br like authorized bread. <laughs> um, and the uh, yeah, and the people in this story like hack their toasters so that they can toast unauthorized. Yeah. Yeah. See, okay, but look, oppression leads to new innovation. So maybe like, <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to make sure we keep oppression around. Exactly. Or we'll have nothing, no innovation needed. Necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, <laughs> by the way, guys, I hope you realize that. Um, uh, so uh, addressing, oh, hyperlocal coin, Chad Gainer, uh, back at it again with the Chad Gainer. So I think this is a great idea. Um, hyperlocal coins um, to take it even further rather than just like local communities being able to use these things. Um, there's this really awesome think piece I read a while back about uh, the idea of a civic coin. So um, in San Francisco, um, the Bay Area rapid transit is like one of the worst experiences, right? That's our underground tube. And you have to buy tickets from these single booths. And for some reason, you have to buy them at, these, at this one place unless you register manually the ID written on the back of your card. And then you can buy it online. You have to pay a fee. It's like really wow. complicated for that. It's really bad. Um, and in New York, they just got like tap to pay, which I think is New great. great. Yeah, Philly. Philly is similarly not quite as bad as San Francisco's, but yeah, right. it's also yeah. It's, it's yeah. Most people can complain about uh, public transit for like the best hours. is Madrid. Everyone um, go to Madrid, ride the subways once lockdowns are over. Uh, best uh, subway okay. system. Santiago Chile is really good too. But uh, anyways, um, <laughs> so, so one idea I read is this idea that those coins you're basically putting like th this money becomes virtual money you can't get back once you put it on a clipper card um and it's this really cool idea of well what if that money just goes into a fund and it's a digital currency of its own and it can be spent on anything related to a a city right you can spend it on um like local services you can spend it on public transportation you can spend it maybe um well libraries don't charge money but uh, I'm, I'm struggling to think of like other things you spend money on in a city which is ridiculous but um that idea is really good and it's minted this is the key at those like kiosks right because you have to go there anyways basically you're paying in us dollars to mint uh, these currencies or local fiat currency, right? You're minting this civic coin and that's where it's produced. That actually causes a physical constraint. Something that uh, Douglas Rushkov asserted yesterday is that you don't need crypto for like 95, 90, 95% of what a local currency could do. Right. And I'm not sure if I buy that. Like, I feel like digital money is so much easier yeah. Um, that, that it's worth it to have, like, if you could make a hyper local currency, I think, I think it's an idea worth exploring. So yeah. go for I think, it. Well, so, so um, we're out of time uh, in the last minute. I do want to say, if you're, you're curious about these ideas, you want to learn how to specifically go and build them. Uh, Mike Purvis is doing a really great session right after this. If you go, go check out the sessions uh, for the hackathon, even if you don't program, it's actually really valuable to jump in a team thinking about these ideas, thinking about the architecture, thinking about the UI, that stuff, every hackathon I've ever been to, and I've been to a lot, both as a moderator and a judge and a participant, that stuff ends up falling to the wayside because 
you have if you have enough engineers on your team, they they want to focus on like actually building stuff. If you have someone who can pitch, someone who can yeah. come up with like the designs, it's actually really really valuable. Or so, just the, the market and product stuff, right? Like yeah. I was saying with some of these ideas, the tough part is not the tech. Like the tech by comparison is easy, but figuring out the correct way to build it is yeah. actually the hard part. And how to avoid so. creating an evil hyper capitalist dystopia, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. All yes. right. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Chad, uh, for joining. I think that's it. Um, and I, I don't know if Dustin is going to jump back in and uh, say Kick bye. Us off. Yeah, yeah. Agree yeah. 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 We're, awesome. We're thanks, guys. Yeah. No, it was definitely awesome to listen to you know all the various use cases and just uh, how you unpack uh, a lot of problems. So I'm sure everybody cool. really enjoyed it. Thanks. All right. Bye, guys. Fun yeah. to be here. Bye, all. I guess with that said, uh, really thank you for participating in Ready Layer One. Make sure that you head over to the session if uh, you're participating in the hackathon to, you know, see how you can utilize Rust in an easy way as a noob and uh, go through it. But again, thanks. I'm really glad that I could have done this journey with you guys and really excited for uh, what the future brings. Uh, yeah, take care.